Today I'm going to talk about some history, historical things. What does history mean? True history is his story. His story. Whose story? Jesus' story. Okay. History is God's story. Real history is. Today I want to engage a prophetic topic. It's a little bit different than my normal message here. Prophecies are important. They're the testimony of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is framed in prophecy. Peter said it's like a light that shines where? In a dark place. Jesus said that we should beware of false prophets as we wait for Jesus to come. You'll find that in Matthew 24, 11 and 24. As a people, we're looking for Jesus to come and we need solid ground under our feet. I'm not claiming to know everything about today's message, but simply I say, come, let us reason together. Our text today is Luke chapter 21. This is a prophecy of no less than Jesus himself. Luke chapter 21, <clears throat> verses 24 to 27. Luke 21, 24 to 27. It's good to hear the pages rustling. I'm glad this is a Bible church. Do you know the Seventh-day Adventist church is a back to Bible movement? Is that right? Here it says, verse 24, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away into captive into all nations and Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon earth distress of nations with perplexities. Perplexity, what does that mean? I can't take it anymore. It's going to get that way. There's a time of trouble coming such as was since there never was a nation, ever was a nation. Verse 26. Men's hearts failing them for fear, for looking after those things which are coming upon the earth, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. We're all looking forward to that, aren't we? Jerusalem trodden underfoot. In the New Testament, Jerusalem is God's church. That's what Jerusalem is in the New Testament. Now, Jerusalem in the Old Testament represented God's church too, didn't it? That's where they, their headquarters were. That's where the headquarters were for the Jewish nation. But in the New Testament, a change comes. The glorious land, the glorious holy mountain, uh, Jerusalem, refers to God's people, composed of both Jews and Gentiles, males and females. Everybody is involved in this. And Revelation 11.2 says that the holy city is trodden underfoot for 1260 years. Let's look at it. It's Revelation 11, verse 2. Revelation 11, verse 2. Revelation is always easy to find. I was up at the school yesterday. Uh, yesterday. Yeah, yesterday morning. We read a verse from Revelation. Revelation chapter 1. It's easy to find, right? Behold, he comes with clouds and every eye will see him. But this one is Revelation chapter 11, verse 1. 1 and 2. It says, and there was given me a reed like, unto, like to a rod. And the angel stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that dwell that worship therein. For the court which is outside the temple leave out and measure not for it is given to the Gentiles. And the holy city shall lay trout underfoot 40 and two months. Now those of us who've been studying prophecies believe that that 42 months refers to that 1260 year period uh, the Middle and the Dark Ages, when it's been estimated 50,000 people and more, up to 150 million, lost their lives as martyrs. So <clears throat> Revelation 11, 2 says, the holy city is trodden underfoot for 1260 years. What was trodden underfoot? 
Jesus and John must be talking about the same thing. And then Paul adds this, Romans chapter 11, 25 and 26. Romans chapter 11, 25 and 26. Romans 11, 25 and 26. If you have it, say amen. Boy, you're fast. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness, in part, is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and turn away ungodliness from Jacob. When are the Gentiles, when are the times of the Gentiles fulfilled? I haven't heard this in the sermon forever. <laughs> Adventist preachers used to talk about this at camp meeting 60 years ago. We don't talk about it anymore. So I'm going to talk about it today. So when will Israel, when will all Israel be saved? He says that, doesn't he? And who is all Israel in the New Testament? In the all New Testament, all Israel is God's people, everyone who puts their faith and trust in Jesus. Jew and Gentile, male and female, bond and free. New New, in New Testament, all Israel is God's church, Jews and Gentiles, all who have the faith of Abraham. They're the olive tree in, Revel in Romans chapter 11, God's olive tree. Some branches have been cut off. Some of those branches are grafted back in, and Gentile branches are grafted into that tree. God's purpose is to save everybody in the world. For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him, whosoever believes in him, we're all whosoever's, right? And the people all around us are whosoever's. He, made, he paid the price for every last person who lives in the world. Spiritual Israel, the change came when Jesus was so soundly rejected and hung on the cross, and the city of Jerusalem was destroyed by flames. In the 1960s, some of you are old enough to remember this, there was a six-day war in Palestine. Preachers of many denominations began to mention these scriptures, and not a few Adventists even began to wonder if the time of the Gentiles had been fulfilled. <laughs> Get the picture? But those who take their texts from the Bible and preach from the newspaper are sure to err in their interpretation of the Word of God. You've got to be careful about that. Rather, we need to compare Scripture with Scripture. We've read from Jesus and John and Paul about this. There are two more, and those two more are Daniel and Ezekiel. Daniel and Ezekiel. So come this morning, let us reason. <clears throat> if we will consider the end time scriptures in the light of Daniel Revelation, we shall be saved from a lot of confusion that exists outside of the Advent movement, and even sometimes within the Advent movement. And we shall receive glorious light if we take our message from, from the Bible. Indeed, Revelation is the revelation of who? Jesus Christ. It's an un unveiling of Jesus. We understand Jesus better when we read Revelation, as from his temple in heaven. He governs the affairs on earth and allows this and restricts that. He picks up kings and takes them down. That's where I want my interpretation to come from. We're talking in these verses in Luke and Romans about the times of the Gentiles ending or being over with. And then all Israel will be saved. Let's begin by asking, when did the times of the Gentiles begin? If we want to talk about when they ended, when did they begin? If we can determine that, we're halfway in determining when the times of the Gentiles will end. Does that make sense? When Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea, preserved them in the wilderness wanderings, through the Jordan into the promised land. They were a theocracy. What is a theocracy? Governed by God himself. God was their king. 
they dealt directly with God, right? Through his servant Moses and Aaron. They were answerable only to God. They weren't under Gentile rule, meaning the strong nations around them were not governing them. The Gentiles were not over them. Who was their king? God was their king. And Moses and later Joshua and the judges and the prophets who were raised up to guide the people into in safe paths under the direct rulership of who? God. Because of hard hearts, it didn't always turn out that way in God's favor. But that was the goal. God was raising up a nation to make himself known to the nations all around, right? We have the story of Jonah. That's one way he did that, right? Then the day came when they wanted a king. And the period of the kings began. Good kings, bad kings. But God still blessed his people, his nation, with sovereignty over the nations, sovereign, without sovereignty from the nations around them, right? They weren't over the nations, but they weren't governed by those nations. During this period, the children of Israel were split into two kingdoms, northern ten tribes, and southern Judah and half the tribe of Benjamin in the environs of Jerusalem. All because of rebellion against God, they were split. But while all this was going on, Gentile kingdoms were building around them. The mighty Assyrian Empire ruled the Middle East for centuries, two or three centuries. They were to the east and to the north, and they were a constant menace to Israel. And when the ten northern tribes of Israel became rebellious to the extreme, their cup of iniquity was full. They lost their sovereignty. They were smitten by the Assyrians and scattered among the Gentile nations that were, in the, were, were within the mighty Assyrian Empire. It happened in the 700s BC. The southern kingdom, composed of the tribe of Judah and half the tribe of Benjamin, continued for another century over by Jerusalem, that part of that southern part. But as the 600s BC dawned, Babylon came to be a world power. We're going to sing about that in our closing song today. It's a song of prophecy. Babylon came to be a world empire. Nabopolassar and his son Nebuchadnezzar, we know his name a little better, don't we? They overcame the Assyrian Empire, really sort of an extension with new rulers. Same territory. God's people at Jerusalem were at that time engaged in serious rebellion against God. The kings were often wicked and idolatrous. Josiah was the last good king, and Daniel was about 15 or 16 years old when Josiah died, that good king. And just two or three years later, the Babylonians came down upon hapless Judah and established Gentile sovereignty over Jerusalem. First time now, right? They had been under who before? God was shepherding his nation through the centuries. Here is when the times of the Gentiles commenced. Jerusalem and the people of God were trodden down by the Gentiles. And remained so for many centuries to follow. It was then that the crown was taken from Israel and given to the Gentiles according to the word of the Lord by, by the way of Ezekiel. Let's turn to Ezekiel. This is an important passage. I, I, would, I would encourage you to, if you have a good Bible commentary, sit down and study Ezekiel, the 21st chapter. A change comes here. Ezekiel was one of those captives that went down to Babylon in the second invasion. Ezekiel chapter 21. Notice the words. These are tremendous words to try to understand. When we read verses 25 to 27. And you, profane, wicked prince of Israel. Who's he referring to here? King of Israel, right? Whose day has come when iniquity shall have an end. Thus says the Lord God, remove the diadem. Take off the crown. This shall be the same, this shall not be the same. 
It will not be the same. How was it before? God was in charge, right? It will not be the same. Exalt him that is low and abase him that is high. I will overturn, overturn, overturn. How many overturns? I will overturn, overturn, overturn. And it shall be no more until he come whose right it is to rule. Who might that be? Jesus. He was the one who was to sit on the throne of David. So, Ellen G. White, in commenting on this passage, here's what she has to say. The crown removed from, this is an Education 179. If you want to follow up on this in your home study, it's Education 179. I think that's the best book she ever wrote. If you don't have a book of education, it's a good one. It's filled with wisdom. It doesn't create new doctrines, but it's filled with wisdom. And here's what she said. The crown removed from Israel passed successively to Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome. God says it shall be no more until he come whose right is, it is to rule, and I will give it to him. That's the end of the quote. Concerning the throne of David in Jerusalem, God said, I will overturn, overturn, overturn. There's a reason why overturn is used three times in this passage. There were through three overturnings of Jerusalem. And the throne of David by the Babylonians. In 605 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar came to Jerusalem and subjected it. 605 B.C. And uh, made a vassal state out of Jerusalem. No longer in direct rule by God himself. He took certain captives, young men of intelligence. And Daniel was one of those captives in that first invasion. 17, 18 years old by now. And he was carried off to Babylon. That's the subject of Daniel chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Jehoiakim was left on the throne. Jehoiakim, spelled with an M at the end. The alphabet says M, N. The next one was Jehoiachin, N, M, N, okay. And the last one was a man by the name of Zedekiah, the last of the alphabet. One way to remember that. I have to use those kind of things in order to remember these things. Jehoiakim was left on the throne. That's when Daniel had been hauled off to Babylon, left his family, all of that. But he knew why they were going. He knew Jeremiah. Jeremiah was alive when Daniel was a teenager. And teenagers here, and those who were pre-teenagers here, pay attention. <laughs> okay. This is important stuff. And I don't, I use that word stuff reverently. Jehoiakim was left on the throne, subject to Nebuchadnezzar. When Jehoiakim rebelled against the Babylonian authority, contrary to the pleas of, Jer of, of Jeremiah, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem again. Another invasion, 597. It was at that time that Ezekiel, that second invasion, overturn, overturn, overturn. This is the second time now. Ezekiel was taken captive, and he was taken down to Babylon. This time he took Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim off the throne and established Jehoiachin, M-N, okay? And then Zedekiah on the throne. And when Zedekiah rebelled, Nebuchadnezzar lost all patience with the kingdom of Judah. For the third time, 586 B.C., he sent armies to Jerusalem, and thus the city was utterly destroyed. The sanctuary was given to the flames, most people were carried off to Babylon and worse. And they went to a land of strange faces and strange languages. How do you think they felt? Ezekiel describes their sadness. He says they hung their harps on the willows and sang no more the songs of Zion. They were totally conquered. So David's throne was overturned, overturned, overturned. Times of the Gentiles began. Passed successively through Medo-Persia, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Yet a full end was not made. For God had promised that the throne of David would be established, how long? Forever. 
forever. We're looking forward to that. How many are looking forward to the setting up of God's kingdom? Yeah. You can read about uh, that being established forever in 2 Samuel 7 and Psalms 132. I won't take the time to read it this morning. But this passage in Ezekiel declared that Israel would never again be, have a king sit on their throne until when? He comes whose right it is to rule. Jesus Christ. <clears throat> until that man would take the throne of David, the Gentiles would have Jerusalem over would, the, the Gentiles would have dominion over Jerusalem, and Jerusalem would be trodden down. Old Testament, the Jews. New Testament, God's new nation, the Christian church. When does the son of David again take the throne? That's the big question. When he does, the times of the Gentiles are ended, right? Isn't that what we've been reading? The short answer is when the times of Gentiles are fulfilled. Let's reason together from Daniel chapter 8. This is, our, this is our chapter. We wouldn't be here this morning talking about these things if it wasn't for Daniel, the eighth chapter. I'll guarantee you. Some of us would be good Baptists. Some of us would be good Methodists. Some of us would be good Presbyterians. Some of us would be good Catholics. This passage in Daniel 8 is specifically about the rise of the Advent movement. Daniel chapter 8. Daniel chapter 8. I'm going to read several verses here, starting with verse 8, down through verse 14. I'm sorry. First of all, I want to read Daniel 7. Is that what I said first? I think I had it wrong. Daniel 7. I want to start with Daniel 7. I want to start with verse 8. 8 through 14. I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, this horn was, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. What kind of things? Some translations say boastful things. I will be like the Most High, reminiscent of the devil himself, right? I beheld till thrones were cast down, or some translations say thrones were placed, set up. And the Ancient of Days did sit. Who's that? God the Father, right? He's seated on the throne. This is the judgment now. Whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like a fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. <clears throat> Movable throne here. Verse 10. A fiery stream issued forth and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered to him. Ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. By the way, who are these people? Who are these, these beings? These are the angels, right? There could be more angels <laughs> around that throne, and that judgment is going on today in heaven. There could be as many angels around that throne as there are people living on the earth, and maybe even more. We have guardian angels, don't we? 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. It leaves it open. The judgment was set and the books were opened. And I beheld because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld till the beast was given to the flame, that till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As concerning the rest of the beasts that have, they had their dominion taken away, what happened? That they had their dominion taken away. The beasts that are found in the first part of Daniel 7, they had their dominion taken away. When? In the judgment. These are these kingdoms of Medio Persia, ba uh, Babylon, Medio Persia, Greece, and Rome. And there, yet their lives were prolonged for yet a season and a time. And I saw in the night visions, behold, one like the Son of Man. Who might that be? Come with the clouds of heaven. Now, this is not the second coming. He's coming to the clouds in the, with the clouds of heaven to the place where the Ancient of Days is seated. Okay? And they came and, and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom. That answers our question, right? 
When is the, is the Son of Man given a dominion again? When does he sit on the throne of David? It happens in the judgment hour. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom and all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall never pass away, not, shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall never or not be destroyed. And then notice verse 15. Daniel is having some trouble with this. And I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body and the visions of my head troubled me. He's looking forward to going back and rebuilding Jerusalem again. Maybe the kingdom restored again. Maybe somebody will sit on the throne of David again. He's terribly troubled. He's a man in his 90s now. And he's thinking that they're going to be going back. The 70 years that they were to be in captivity by, brought by Jeremiah have almost expired. To him, the empires of the bear and the leopard and the great and terrible beast in the first part of Daniel 7 would take a long, long time. A lot longer than 70 years, and he was grieved. In Daniel 9, he's still thinking about this when Daniel 8, 14 comes up. 2,300 years, and he's still grieved over this. He kneels down, and he prays a long prayer. And Gabriel comes and answers that prayer. Yes, you will go back, but it won't be the kingdom restored. If it was the kingdom restored, then who would be the king? Jesus. Daniel was one of those captives. He had waited patiently through the centuries in exile, waiting for the 70 years to be fulfilled. The 70 years were almost fulfilled, and Daniel was almost 90. He was grieved to the core. And uh, little wonder that when Jesus came, they were looking for a Messiah who would do what? Set up the kingdom again, right? Restore the, king, the throne of David. Through a series of visions, Daniel was shown that the crown would, would not return to Israel when Babylon rule was ended. But the crown would pass to, to three more Gentile kingdoms before it would return to the people of God. And judgment was then promised. We just read it. That's when these Gentile kingdoms would, would receive their judgment. And the beast would be given to the flame. When? In the judgment. We're living in the time of the judgment. Jesus is about to establish his throne again. We're looking forward to the second coming of Christ. This time it'll be a glorious kingdom. Is that right? The first time it was a kingdom of grace. We're all under grace now. But when he comes again, it'll be a kingdom of glory. Each of those powers would tread down God's people at Jerusalem and beyond. Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, and, Roman, and Rome's successor, the medieval church, would tread down God's people for another 1,260 years. Terrible scourgings took place during that time. You can read about it in Daniel 7. Let's do it. Daniel 7, 24 and 25. Here's what it says. Daniel 7. 24 and 25 mentions the 1260 years again and the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall rise and another shall rise after them and he shall be diverse from the first and he shall do sub three, subdue three kings and he shall speak great words against the Mohab most high wear out the saints of the most high and think to change times and laws that is God's times and God's laws right and they shall be given into his hand until a time's time and a dividing of times. How long is that? 1260 years. Now, if some of you are a little rusty on this and, or haven't heard this before, how this can come to 1260 years, I'd encourage you to come to prayer meeting. We're talking about some of these things. These are important ideas here. Then, notice something. Daniel is very consistent. Let's look at verse 26. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion. Who's that? Satan's dominion. And Satan works through all these, these powers, right? These, these evil powers, starting with Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Rome, and the, and the successor to the Roman Empire, who would last for 1260 years, and destroy it and consume it to the end. 
Verse 27, and the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to who? The people, the saints of the most high. Whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. And then it says in verse 28, Daniel is still, still pretty upset about this whole thing. The judgment shall sit and take his way to his dominion. When do the times of the Gentiles end? After all these kingdoms finally come to an end or are judged, and in the judgment they're judged. The devil's kingdom. He worked through all these kingdoms. Yes, Babylon, Media Persia, Greece, Rome, and the successor to Rome, who lasted for 1260 years. And notice Daniel's response, verse 28, we just read it. I'm way ahead of my notes here. I have to have these notes. Otherwise, I forget some things. And if I leave some things out, then they're probably important things to leave out. This is a connected story. This is his story, history. Daniel 8, after revealing his plan, the he goat and the, and the ram, Medo Persia and Greece, and after revealing, really revealing all this, he says, Unto 2,300 years, then shall the what? Sanctuary be cleansed. You know, the cleansing of the sanctuary in ancient Israel was, was the judgment. Those who did not cooperate on the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, were cut off from Israel. Talks about that in Leviticus 23. 2,300 years, day for a year. 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The judgment of Daniel 7 comes at the end of 2,300 years. The Day of Atonement, cleansing the sanctuary, Judgment Day. And what's Daniel's response? Oh, my. We could just read this, just to make this a little more brief. Daniel 8, in the last verse of Daniel 8. Daniel is really stirred up now. Verse 28, or 27. I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. He couldn't believe that he thought in his reckoning, he thought that the end of 70 years, when they went back, they could restore the kingdom. Didn't happen. All these Gentile kingdoms. And Daniel, in his prophecy that was given to him by Gabriel, had it right. It's going to take ages and ages and ages, centuries and centuries and centuries. It says, uh, I, Daniel, fainted for six certain days after what, and rose up and did the king's business. And I was astonished at the vision, but none understood it. Well, I'm winding down. Believe it or not. Daniel falls on his knees. And that's the subject of Daniel chapter 9, the first verses. He falls on his knees. He said, why, Lord? I don't understand this. And God gives him a partial answer to his question in the 24th and 25th verses of chapter 9. Yes, God made a partial restoration in accordance to his word. After the 70 years were up, 536 B.C., Cyrus makes a decree for them to go back and rebuild Jerusalem. But the kingdom wasn't restored. Not a kingdom. No dominion on David's throne for centuries off into the future. When? Did that Gentile rule end? It rules in the judgment. That's when the judgment takes place of those Gentile kingdoms who caused so much trouble and heartache for the people of God, for the church down through the centuries. The long, weary years of Media Persia, Greece, Rome, those Gentile kingdoms would rule. And 1260 more years of a great church state power that even killed God's people by the millions and slaughtered them. That 1260 years was from, who knows what the, what, what the, what the dates are? 538 to 1798. 1798. Right, you are students of prophecy, that's what we understand. But the judgment shall sit and take away his dominion, take away these Gentile dominions, and God would rise up and people would give the judgment our message. He would raise up a people to give the judgment our message to to announce the end of the Gentile rule that Jerusalem would be over, 
trodden underfoot for 1,260 more years. After 1798, what happened? The rise of the Advent movement. If you think this is something really small, it's not. This is God's answer with the three angel messages to the hour of his judgment has come. That's what it says in the first angel, right? What does it mean to the people of God that the hour of his judgment has come? It simply means that the Gentile rule is going to be over with. The church will be trodden underfoot until when? The judgment. We know when it started. And we know what started it. Now we have an answer to when it ends. When he will restore all things. Now let's go to Revelation. And we read Revelation 11, 1 and 2, a measuring line. What does that have to do with anything? It's the judgment hour. It's announcing the judgment in Revelation 11, 1 and 2. But if we go back in Revelation 11 and look at the last verse of chapter 10. By the way, Revelation chapter 10 is the prophecy of the rise of the Advent movement. You know, nobody talks about Revelation 10 except us. Nobody. This is about the rise of the Advent movement. And what was the Advent movement was to do? Announce the hour of God's judgment has come. That's the first angel. So let's take a look at that last part of Revelation 10, which, which is a description of the rise of the Advent. You remember about the bitter and the sweet? Okay, all of that is in there. Finally, a people arise and they're given a commission. And that commission is given to us this morning. Verse 11. Chapter 10, verse 11. Revelation chapter 10, verse 11. And he said to me, you must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Preach this message. It's a judgment hour message. That's what he's commissioning his people to do today. Because this will mark the end of Gentile rule. Wow, to me, this is such an exciting thing. Revelation 10 says, then the mystery of God will be finished. This message must be repeated to all the world. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I'll be done by quarter after, I promise. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. These pathfinders sitting in the front row, they're soaking all this in. <laughs> Revelation 14, 6 and 7. I saw another angel or messenger fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. How far wide? Everywhere. Psalm says, Psalms chapter 1 says, I'm going to give you the nations for your inheritance. What an idea. Saying with a loud voice. What kind of a voice? A loud voice. It wakes everybody up. Fear God and give glory to him for the hour of his what? Judgment has come. When this message goes forth, it isn't coming. It's here. And when it's over with, guess what happens? Gentile rule is over. And Jesus will be installed as our king again throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. Do you love the second coming of Christ? Through these centuries, God's people have been subjugated. They lost the kingship at the last captivity. Overturn, overturn, overturn. That's the setting for our message, the judgment hour message. What happens when the judgment hour really goes forth to the world? The judgment shall sit and they shall take away his dominion. And the kingdom shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. They're the ones that have been trodden down all through the centuries. The kingdom will be given back to them again, away from Gentile rule. The three angel messages are especially designed to bring an end to Gentile rule and usher in the kingdom of God. It's about time, don't you think so? In the seventh seal, fifth seal, I'm sorry, the martyrs are crying out, how long, O oh Lord, how long is this going to go on? Can we see that God has a plan? The plan is in our hands. We have been given understanding of these things. We should study the prophecies because the, the prophecies, testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Jesus is framed in the prophecies. I desperately want to be a part of that plan along with 
all of you. As we sing this closing song, look for the way marks. Let's sing with understanding the words of these prophetic voices. This was penned a lot of years ago by people of the Advent movement, by the people of the three angel messages. The long rule of the Gentiles over with, the judgment in progress. Soon, none know how soon, it will pass to the living generation. And the dominion will be taken out of the Satan's hands as the Gentile rule comes to an end. And Christ will sit on David's throne forever. Then, then, all Israel will be saved. <laughs> all of God's people will go home. He said, he promised, didn't he promise that to us? He says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will what? I'll come again and I'll take you to my father's house, right? Amen. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we look to these great prophetic waymarks. They're our anchors. And Jesus is our anchor. He's going to sit on your throne, Lord. And I just pray that, that all of us here, as an undivided group, will keep the faith. Please be with each one here according to our several needs. And make us love your appearing. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.